You know, I randomly saw this this Twitter account coming up, and I'm like, no, who, who's, who's this guy? Keep popping up on my timeline. So, you know, I came across, saw it was you, and I, I saw the wide receiver tolls. I'm like, man, I, I love what he's doing. So, uh, yeah, you know, it was uh, like I've never really been a big social media guy. I mean, I had it some Instagram and messed around with it a little bit here and there, just for all my past players and all, you know, and mm-hmm. uh, kind of just making sure I can stay up with all of them and a great way to communicate and kind of watch all of them in regards to you know, watching them get married and kids and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So that's been really neat. But my wife has been uh, telling me now for a couple of years, I need to get on that Twitter or whatnot and just kind of, <laughs> I guess, you know, like, so what, like what we're doing, just get out there and kind of, you know, pop some things on there. Everyone, the two minute thing, man, gee, many Christmas, that thing goes yeah. so fast. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it's been good to get on there, you know, obviously and, and getting a hold of some guys and obviously connecting the guys like you and, Mm-hmm. and uh you know stuff that i haven't really been involved with before so it you know obviously it's with the times that we're in right now so it's pretty yeah, neat makes sense yeah and, that, and that's why i loved it because you know someone like me and i know other coaches too it's like you're at the highest level right you're, you're an nfl wide receiver coach so for us to have someone on there engaging with us and actually you know not you know giving good feedback and tips and stuff giving free knowledge but also interacting back and you know, saying like, "Hey, what do you guys do? What do you guys teach? Like, what buzzwords and, and things do you do?" So that's why I mean, I've been following like crazy recently, just seeing it because it, it, it's exciting seeing what you know high school coaches are saying, you know, former players, um, you know, NFL guys all chiming in. So yeah, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. I think it's been uh, real valuable for everyone. You know, even the guys. Well, I appreciate playing. it. Yeah, yeah, it's been so, fun uh, for sure. It's been neat. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, so um, before we kind of get into everything, if you could just kind of give just a, a short, quick um, intro about yourself, you know, your journey and you know, how you got to here. And then um, <laughs> while, while, while kind of you're just going through that briefly, I'm going to chime in and, and ask some questions while you cover those things. Okay. Uh, boy, I thought you said we only had an hour, but uh, yeah, man, I, I've been on a, uh, I've been really fortunate. Uh, you know, I hate to use the word I, but you know, you asked the question. And, um, so obviously the journey that I've been on, um, it's been crazy. You know, I was a, uh, all state player at a high school in Columbus, mm-hmm. Ohio. And, uh, I was runner up to player of the year to Charles Woodson for the player of the year in the state of Ohio. And I had no offers. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so my idea was to take a, an opportunity that I had to go be a preferred walk on at Ohio state. So Played two years at Ohio State, developed physically, and then all of a sudden uh, was like the second or third fastest guy on the team. And mm-hmm. so went in and asked for a scholarship, wanted to get a scholarship, didn't work out, ended up transferring to Northern Iowa. Went out there for three years. I was three-time All-American at Northern Iowa, and uh, nobody wanted me, so nobody drafted me. Yeah. So, question, question about that. So when you, when, you, um, when you walked on Ohio State and then left, did you also walk on to the following school, or did they have an offer for you? No, so when I, I uh, when I decided I wanted to leave Ohio State, the reason why was because I had a, a full ride offer from Northern Iowa, okay. uh, from a guy who was the who who would be who was just selected to be the head coach at Northern Iowa by mm-hmm. a guy named Mike Dunbar, okay. who was uh, at that time was the offensive coordinator for Gary Pinkle at Toledo, okay. and uh, they had come down to the Rose Bowl practices and had seen me practice and then heard I wanted to transfer and. He mm-hmm. called me a little bit later in the spring because he wanted, you know, obviously was waiting to see if he got that job or not, yeah. and he did. And next thing I know, I'm driving out to Northern Iowa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, well, that that was my question. I didn't know if you walked on twice because, you know, I, I did a little research just trying to get your background and stuff too. But yeah. um, I, I was a walk on as well. I walked on to um, an FCS school, Robert Morris University. Yeah, um, and yeah. I and I get a I get a lot of guys that ask me, you know, I'm thinking about walking on. You know, can you give me some? some tips and stuff. And I, and I explained my story, what I went through um, and try to give them the best information possible. But I, I would love to hear um, what you recommend to people that come to you about, you know, walking on since you've had, you have more experience with it. Yeah. You know, what, what a great question. And uh, th- this is a question that I really have enjoyed um, over throughout my career, because obviously there's mm-hmm. a lot of kids that I have been engaged with, uh, you know, throughout my career of playing where I'd go back and train them. And then they're in high school, my father-in-law, uh, my father-in-law and his twin brother coached high school ball for about a hundred years combined. And, um, 
So when I would go home in the off season or whatnot, I was around their football players all the time. So, you know, you got a lot of these kids that are trying to decide. Right. So this question has come up a lot. And I always go back to the, the, the question of if you did not go and walk on a division one school, would you ever regret that down the road? And, um, and that was kind of my, my idea um, or my response to them. And the reason why Sean was because I don't ever want to live with regret mm-hmm. and I want to know if I can do it, you know, of course. Yeah. And so um, if I just didn't really care about trying and it didn't bother me that if I, you know, to prove to myself that I could do it, then, you know, obviously and then just go, you know, go to a, you know, the school that wants you. But mm-hmm. if you really feel like you could play division one, if you really feel, like that's where, you know, that you want to experience that and you want to find right. out for yourself, like Chris. that's what you want to do or that if you can do it, then you got to go do it. And it's not one year. You know, I always told the guys, mm-hmm. you got to give it two years. You have to give it two years, yep. uh, one year to be around the system, the second year, uh, to, you know, to get involved in the system. And the second year, obviously, while you're there to, uh, you know, you know, you, you now you kind of have, you're kind of comfortable, yep. you kind of know the surroundings and now you can kind of go attack some of your goals and, then make a decision after that, you know, that red shirt freshman year. And, 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 you know, but you can prove to yourself, like I know now, like I know that I could have played at a hostage. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? Of course. But that just wasn't the, the journey that God had put me on. So yeah. um, that wasn't that path. And so, but I know comfortably right now that I could have played at Ohio state and, and I'm really, really glad I did it. Um, and I'd have no regret of trying. Uh, I would have had total regret of going to a smaller school mm-hmm. and not knowing that if I could have played at Ohio State. And, and uh, I'll tell you the other thing too, Sean. When I transferred to Northern Iowa, there was a there was a confidence that I had mm-hmm. uh, when I did Absolutely. transfer because I knew, like, listen, I could play at Ohio <laughs> State. Now I'm yeah. going to Northern Iowa. Like, this is about to be really, really good. Um, of course. And uh, yeah, so do you, yeah, so you know, there's what a great question for a lot of kids that yeah. are out there that had that opportunity. <laughs> But uh, if you would ever regret not going and uh, not knowing, then you need to That's go true. for two years and, and let it lay it out. Yeah, no, I, I really wanted to hear your story because, you know, mine, I mean, I, t- I tell guys that are interested, it's, it is not easy. <laughs> you have to no. be ready to work. <laughs> you have to be ready to work. And, and you know, it was yeah. one of those things where, you know, I was always a good athlete. I was first team all conference and in, in uh, Pennsylvania, we had this thing called the Fab 22. So, like, I was fab 22. I'd go to these camps, do really well. But, you know, my size, I wasn't the biggest, fastest. So, you know, I started getting frustrated. I'm like, maybe I'm not good enough. Like, I, I don't know. These coaches yeah. aren't really calling me. And I had um, St. Francis University um, offer me a preferred walk-on. So I went up there for a visit and I was like, I, I can't go here. So I ended up, um, mm-hmm. I was like, you know, I don't really want to go D2 or D3, just me being competitive. And there's nothing wrong with that. But just having that fire in me, I know I can play at yeah. a higher level. So, um you know, I, what I did was, so they started, and Rob Moore started announcing the recruiting waves. So I went on and I looked up every recruit and they put their highlight tape. So I had my highlight tape in theirs and I said, okay, I can play here. So I, I like I said, I, I walked on, I was fortunate enough that some kid quit after the first day. So I came in early during camp, but like you said, that first year is just making a name for yourself and just outworking everyone. And then, you know, this, the second year, so I ended up starting as a red shirt freshman. So that, you know, that's, <laughs> you got to go in there and you just got to yeah. put the work in and just, so yeah, that was, that's great feedback. I, I, but I, I, but I think to your point, what you just said is, is I think the best, uh, it can be the best answer to any kid that has that opportunity to do that. When, when you decide that that's what you want to do, because you want to find out if you can do it or not, mm-hmm. you, you go in there with no expectations mm-hmm. and you literally go in there and work out work every single person that's in that facility. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. uh, and, and cause you have that little chip on your shoulder where they don't yep. think you belong. And, and then once you start going there and you kind of start understanding hold on time out, I can, you know, I've mm-hmm. never really been in the weight room. I can develop, I can start yep. playing and I know I can catch better than anybody. So mm-hmm. like, this is going to be interesting, but to your point, you literally have to go there in regard and, and have literally a clear mind mm-hmm. where you're, you're yeah. not okay. After the first year, if I'm not here, if I'm not, you can't, you literally have to have a clear mind and go in there to me and to go in there and just absolutely lay everything out on the line, mm-hmm. outwork everybody, be the first guy yeah. in there in the facility, the last guy to leave. Uh, like I said, you know, get in that weight room and become the strongest. Just like you just like watch, let, watch people like, you know, open up people's eyes to see like, hold mm-hmm. on time out. We got to, 
this guy's doing some stuff. And so yeah. let's keep an eye on him. And then I was going to put it in their hands, you know, mm-hmm. and I did, you know, I walked in and, and, uh, after my second year, um, and I walked in and I said, Hey, you know, I just was, I just broke your all time agility record. <laughs> you know, yeah. I just, I just, I'm the third fastest guy on your football team. I just ran a four, three, eight. And, uh, it's documented. Like I broke yeah. all your all time records. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I get a scholarship, it's in your hands. And they were like, you know, listen, you're a hometown kid and, you know, whatnot. And uh, I'll tell you what, Sean, probably one of the hardest things I've ever gone through in my life because I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Like, mm-hmm. that's all I wanted to do was yeah. play at Ohio State. Yeah. And uh, to leave there, uh, it was just kind of a it was the, it was probably one of the toughest things that I've had to do to swallow. Mm-hmm. But it was absolutely the greatest decision I've that's ever true. made because of the fact that somebody told me I couldn't do it. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I just had that fire. And, and, uh, at that point in time, it wasn't to catch footballs at Ohio state. Uh, at that time it became, I'm going to catch footballs in the NFL. And if it's not at Ohio state, then that's fine. I I, I mean, I'll be more happier with a couple hundred balls in the NFL than I will at Ohio state. Yeah. And and that's what kind of the, the walk on mindset is, you know, and me going through it is there were guys that were on full scholarship, but you can tell they kind of, like they're on a full scholarship. They don't, they have it. They have it already. Like, you know, if they drop a ball. It is what it is. Me as a walk on and you too, if you drop one ball, it's, I mean, <laughs> the coaches see that. So it's, yeah. there's no room for error. So you, you definitely have that extra chip and that, you know, you're always working to be perfect because you have to be. And then for me, it was, if I don't get a scholarship, I'm going to be $80,000 in debt. So it, it was do or die at that point. Yeah. It's like I either get a scholarship or I'm going to be 80 to a hundred thousand dollars in debt. So um, that's right. Yeah, it really, I, I think it's a good thing and it pushes you, but it, it is definitely a challenge. So, man, it's, um, it's a, uh, it, it is a, it's a, it is a challenge. I mean, nobody gives you a chance, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, matter of fact, when I got there, I was number 98 when I got to Ohio State. I was number 98. <laughs> that was my jersey number. Uh, I was 36. Uh, when I got to Ohio State. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just sitting here <laughs> thinking, like, yeah. But, you know what, Sean, everywhere I've gone throughout my journey, and we'll talk about some of this, it sounds like, but, I've always had a guy there to mentor me and a guy take me under their wing. And I've had, I've always had a lot of guys that I could go against that were pretty daggone good. Yeah. And so that's, you know, I'm, you know, my freshman, my red shirt, my red shirt freshman year at Ohio state, I literally practiced every single day against Sean Springs and Antoine Winfield. I mean, you're talking two first round draft picks out of Ohio state. Yeah. And so, uh, and then Terry Glenn, the great Terry Glenn from Ohio state, the wide receiver, it was kind of like my mentor, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, he's had a heck of a career in the NFL. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's been pretty neat, but, uh, but they don't do that to your point, unless they respect you right. for what you're doing and how you, you know, how you show up and work every day and you don't back down to them. You don't take it easy on them. Mm-hmm. And then they respect you because you're, you know, you're making them better, but then in return, you're making yourself better. And that confidence is growing. Yeah. Once you get that confidence, Hey, you can, you can do anything. Once That's you right. That's awesome. right. So, so then, yeah, you, you, you move on to another school and then um, kill it there. And then, so kind of tell me how the transition, cause you went undrafted, correct? I did. So uh, I was undrafted in the draft and then um, I had a couple, I, I, I did have a, a bunch of teams at the end, you know, mm-hmm. that I could choose from. And we decided to choose the Indianapolis Colts and uh, went to the Indianapolis Colts as a free agent. And I actually made it to the last team meeting that the, supposedly if you made it to the team meeting, you were on mm-hmm. the team. You were good. You, you were good. And I made it to the team meeting. And uh, right when I walked out of that team meeting, I was asked to go see Coach Mora in his office. And, uh, you know, I was sitting in his office and he looked at me and he said, listen, I can see you playing 10 years in this league, but we're going to have to let you go. And mm-hmm. obviously to me, I'm like, well, if you can see me playing 10 years in the league, like, why am I well, leaving? What's wrong? Yeah. But uh, he let me go, and and uh, I went home and tried to figure out what I was going to do, and just to try to figure out how I was gonna, how I was going to continue to play football. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and what I loved was you were you actually played both sides of the ball. Like you you went to defense. So going off that, so playing wide receiver in the NFL and playing defense, um, how important do you think it is for receivers to be able to read defenses? Like what, what's, what's your input on that? Cause I, I, I see a lot of coaches like you need to read this, this, and this, or is it just kind of have a, a quick understanding? Cause I, I get asked this question a lot. So I'm looking, you playing both sides of the ball in the NFL, you know, like what is your thoughts on that? And how do you teach it? Yeah. You know, there is a, um, 
there is an advantage, obviously, when you can, when you've played both sides, uh, mm-hmm. you, you feel it's more that you kind of get to feel that space that you're in on both sides. If that makes any sense, like you can actually get, I, I've actually got a chance to feel what it's like as, as a, a nickel, you know, a nickelback lining up against Donald driver, like, mm-hmm. wow. You know, yeah. like, okay, man, I better be on, you know, so you, you kind of, you kind of get a feel for both of those sides, which you don't ever experience when you're just playing one side. And right. so when you're, when you're playing wide out, looking at a corner, you're really just trying to figure out what he's doing and how he's going to react. And, and you're trying to worry about him, but you don't really realize that on the other side of the ball, that guy's really worried about you because in single high man defense, he can't give up this or he can't give up that, or he really is on an Island or some mm-hmm. things like that, you know? So yeah. there are some things there that uh, I definitely, I go back all the time and I said, man, I, I wish, I wish I would have known back in the day what I know now in regards from playing both sides because I didn't play it long enough to where you know you could really figure it out um but uh, you know because it wasn't until um you know I played safety a little bit in St. Louis I started 13 games at safety and then went right over to the uh, you know the offensive side of the ball back to the offensive side of the ball mm-hmm. and it just it just you could see everything and you knew how people were to react and you knew their landmarks way better you know mm-hmm. and uh, I just don't know if players uh, that are just one sided. How much they'll ever really pick that up? You know, just being on the one side. So that's right. a, that's a that's a great question by all those guys because I know we spend a lot of time yeah. talking about coverages, mm-hmm. but in reality, there's so many details right about yeah. the coverage, and I think sometimes us as coaches forget. And and you and I had this because we you and I played this position, so it's a little bit easier for us to understand. Mm-hmm. But I think there's a lot of coaches out there that didn't play the position. That are that they're they try to coach so much that mm-hmm. they don't realize that in five seconds or six yeah. seconds you're trying to tell me to line up what's my stance supposed to be like how I'm supposed to release versus this type of press for this type of route let alone mm-hmm. I got to understand if it's two man or man to man or what coverage it is Correct. or if he's rerouting me or who's over top and you know is it a time throw is it you know all those I mean there's Tons yeah. and tons of stuff. Yeah. Let alone take all that away. I got to catch the football too in <laughs> yeah. traffic when I'm about yeah. to get hit. So I think there's there's a point to where you can teach just the simple things, which is which is kind of similar to what we do. I do that now. Mm-hmm. I know everybody's always talked. They read this triangle, read this safety, and all that stuff. Right. Uh, my secret is I just read the cornerback. That and and it's funny you say that because that, that's what I tell a lot of guys. On, and I'm thinking because I, I see a lot of people teaching like you know read the defense, and I'm like. When I remember playing, we didn't even have time because we're looking – the play's over, you jog back, you're looking to the sideline to get the play, and then you're looking at the ref to get lined up, and you're not really paying attention except for the man in front of you. That's so, right. you know, when I try to teach it, I'm just like, hey, you know, if, if you have a slant and he's inside leverage, you just have to know how to win. Like, this, this is where the practice comes in. You just have to know how to win wherever he's playing. I mean, you can get general ideas like, okay, maybe linebackers cheating out real quick or look down the, the center of the field, but – yeah, I think a lot of coaches do like forget that it's it's it happens so fast. You just don't really have time um, to really analyze the defense. You just got to be able to read the guy in front of you and, and be able to win by any means. Yeah, really. I'm with you on that. I, I just, <clears throat> I mean, there's to me, there's three things. It's either the guy's press and he's in man to man. He's off to me, and it's you know, mm-hmm. it's routes on air where he comes up and plays cover two and reroutes you. So yeah, no, I hear you. I mean, <laughs> anything else to me. Yeah. It, you've never played the position before and you don't understand all I can't do all those things. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, just give me the leverage. You know, I might peak the safe. If, if he's off, I might peak the safety just to see where he's at. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if he's pressed, I might peak the safety just to see if it's two man, but the key's going to tell you by leverage and, uh, man, but you want these kids to play as fast as possible. Of so, yeah. um, you know, that, that goes back to, uh, and I sure, I'm sure you believe this too, where a lot of those things you teach, in the off season, uh, in preparation mm-hmm. when you have time, but they're, you know, and, and kind of hope those kids more, I use the word be uh, proactive instead mm-hmm. of reactive, uh, like in some releases and stuff, you want, want to be proactive instead of reactive to them. Right. But we also want to be able to react post snap just by what our thought mm-hmm. process was from stuff that we've studied in the off season or how we've done it. It's happening so fast. Yeah. People, I, they don't realize yeah. it. Yeah. And I tell these guys, like, 
it, it's cool watching, you know, the things I post and other people post, but you, you have to go through it. Like you have to be out there just repping it over and over with no one in front of you. And then with the defender in front of you. So like one-on-ones are, are great for that. So it's, yeah, you just have to go through it and just figure it out on your own, you know? It is. Um, I mean, that's what, you know, you go back to one-on-ones, you know, just talking about like one-on-ones in practice, like, okay. One-on-ones to me in practice is, you know, it's a good way to, you know, it's a good way to kind of see what kind of you know, competitive guy you are. Yeah. But in reality, it's not like, mm-hmm. to me, it's not like, okay, this is like a real game situation. The Correct. quarterback's not getting pressured. He doesn't have to step up. You know, this guy doesn't have to worry about getting beat deep, you know? So to me, yeah. there's a lot of things that you do learn from those, you know, from those, but there's also some things in practice that you don't get to experience until you get in that game. But to you and I, that's why it's great to have done it. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's easier to communicate with my guys uh, because they know I've done it. They know I've been mm-hmm. in those situations. But also, Sean, I think it's really important, and it sounds like you would do this too, but like my, I remove my career away from that, though. Yep. You see what I'm saying? It's really about their career and what's best for them. There's, there might be times where they say, hey, what did you do? You know, okay, I, you know, I, know you knew, I know you knew how to do this or whatnot. Like, what did you do? But more it's going to be like, hey, try this or try that. What do you think, mm-hmm. you know, maybe think about doing this, not, Hey, I did this or I did that, or, you know what I'm saying? So there's yeah, ways you can hurt your relationship too, because of our experiences and playing the game. But, uh, or there's also, you can hurt that relationship by not knowing it either because you didn't play it either. So there's, it's a fine line. Yeah. No, and that's another reason why I, I really liked what you were doing. Cause not only did you play the position at the highest level, but now you're coaching it. So I, I think that's a, a, another reason why, you know, people like working with me as well, because, you know, I can show you and I know, I know you can show guys too. You know, I've seen it on Twitter too. So being able to not only tell them and show them through videos, but to actually be able to show them how this stuff works. It's, it's, I, I think it's so important for these guys because, you know, a lot of time you can just say, okay, you know, this is how it's done or run around this cone. But if you can demonstrate and show it to them, I, I think that goes a long way. So just having that background and being able to move how, how they're supposed to and, and teach these, teach them these things. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's exciting. It's fun stuff. I mean, I love doing it and I know you do too. So, um, yeah, I, I just wish we could get outside and get on some of these fields. Oh, I, I know we were going to try to, we were going to try my assistant and I, we were going to try to, uh, get on the field a little bit and run and do some of these drills and run some uh-huh. of these drills. We were looking forward to that, but we'll get to that once all this stuff clears up. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Hopefully real yeah, soon. it will. It will. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so going from NFL to, to coaching, um, what do you think um, was the biggest challenge for yourself and, and other coaches and, and trainers that, you know, go from playing to coaching, you know, what was kind of like your biggest challenges or things that when you first started, like, Hey man, I like, I wish I would have did this different or, uh, and stuff like that. Just, just to transition to, to being able to do what you did to now teach these young kids. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing, and you know, it happens to all of us, but like we just talked about a little bit of it. You, you got to make sure that when you're transitioning from playing or you've had success, uh, success at playing in the league and then going back to coaching, you, you really have to be careful of saying, OK, I did this and I did that, mm-hmm. you know, oh, when I or, or when I was around Calvin Johnson, like Calvin did this, you know, right, or yeah. like Tory Holder, Isaac Bruce, because those guys aren't like people. I think a lot of coaches get get confused at times where they're always trying to make players like somebody else. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, okay, who are you like? Well, why don't you do this like, uh, you know, Calvin Johnson? Well, you're not Calvin Johnson, you know, (laughs) or why don't you do this? Like, here's what Jerry Rice did or here's what, you know, uh, Andre Risen did, you know. So I don't think – I think there's a mistake there that a lot of guys that do have played, uh, when they come back, they compare the players to so many other people and sometimes it's their selves – because mm-hmm. of what they've done. And those players, they don't want to hear that, Definitely you know? Not. And yeah. so they want to know what's best for them. They want to be challenged like about how to, how to better them as a player, uh, how, what, what can make them better. And I think mm-hmm. that that's just going back and watching their film. And again, like I was just saying, I think the words that you use is, why don't you try this? Or what do you think if you did it this way, what do you think would happen? Now I saw that when Calvin Johnson did it, but I'm not going to sell him say, Hey, do this like Calvin, mm-hmm. you know, um, just stuff. There's so many people. And I used to hate that as a player also mm-hmm. like, Oh man, why don't you, why don't you work as hard as, 
uh, you know, such and such, or why don't you run your routes like such and such? Well, such and mm-hmm. such is a four, three, yeah. six, six foot, three pound player. That's that, that was drafted in the first round that gets away with stuff. Like that's not mm-hmm. me. You mm-hmm. know, I want to be the hard work grinding kid that just catches everything as tough as all get out and trying to make my career. Correct. You know? And, yeah. uh, and so I think there's a fine line of that. I think that happens way too often. Mm-hmm. And then I tell you from just a coaching, from a, from a hiring standpoint, uh, this is true too, that uh, I, I kind of knew this before I even got in, but it's hard for players to get into coaching, especially higher up because they think they know it all just because they've done it. But they also don't put the time in then either to dig into those kids lives. It's just kind of like, Hey, let's just get another person. Well, mm-hmm. that's not, that's not how it works, you know? or they're financially set a little bit. So it's kind of like, well, I don't have to do all that. Like I'm not putting up with that. You know, yeah. I'm not going to spend time away from my family. I got money in the bank. Well, that's not like, well, that's not, you know, that, that shouldn't define you as a coach. And so mm-hmm. that that's a real deal. Now um, I've seen that as a head coach of hiring, hiring guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been really fortunate because we've talked about that from right on, you know, I, cause I, I kind of had an idea about that before I got in. Yeah. But uh, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's out there and it's real. Yeah, it definitely is. I appreciate that. Um, so being a um, former college receiver coach and head coach, I get this question a lot of, of high school kids asking me, you know, how do I get recruited? What do you, what do you coaches look for? Do you have any advice or, or what you looked for or, and, and what these college kids should be doing or a high school kids should be doing looking to get recruited? Yeah, you know, I was on a, uh, on a Zoom deal the other day and I was just listening to a bunch of wide receiver coaches from college talk about who they recruited and, 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 you know, what were they were looking for mm-hmm. when they recruited? Uh, it was funny because they were all saying speed, which we all know that, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. But not everybody's blessed with speed. Sure. So it is what that is. And then, you know, a lot of people, some people were saying track speed. Well, that track speed doesn't fit to football speed. So yeah. there's a, you got to recruit functional speed to me. Um, but to me, that, you know, that here's the other thing too, Sean. Here, how about this? They were saying, I want to see if they can get in and out of their breaks. Mm-hmm. Well, hold on, time out. Can't you teach them that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, like if you if yeah. you're a coach, mm-hmm. like you can teach, they just haven't learned it yet. You can teach people how to get in and of out course. of breaks. That's the easy like, that's, part. You can't you that's, can't coach speed. That's right. So, you know? so so to your point, what are things that you need to look for that you can't coach? Uh-huh. Obviously, it's functional speed. You know, okay. the, the, you know, the guy, the way the guys run around on the field, some, some guys might be four five, four six, but they just create separation just because they have a, uh, they, they have great functional speed because they're smart. They understand the game. They know what coverages are going against. That's simple. That's a, you can recruit that kid. Um, but I'll tell you that the one thing that I love watching and I love watching film on, and, and I think is a huge trait that, that I would want around my program and kids that I would want to recruit mm-hmm. is how they play the game. Like how passionate are they to yeah. play the game? How tough are they when they get that ball in their hands? How relentless are they running with mm-hmm. the football? And you can uh, see you know, that. You can see it when the ball's yeah. out in front of them and they just try to, you know, flail their arms out and the ball gets on the ground and then they kind of mope around. What about the guys that just absolutely lays out for the ball? Mm-hmm. You know, just they play yeah. with an utmost great passion. And uh, and if you could if you can match that with functional speed, obviously, right? And then mm-hmm. you can learn from other people. Is he coachable? Then, you know, obviously, because now you can teach him a lot of things and how hungry he is uh, in regards to that. And then my, the last one would be, you know, being able to sit down with that young man and really finding out like what his goals are. Mm-hmm. You know, there's sure. so many people say today, oh, I'm going to try to, I'm going to be in the league because I want to financially take care of my family. <laughs> yeah. Heard that a hundred times. Well, what happens when you get there, right? And, and you take, start taking care of your family. And now all of a sudden you don't have any money anyway because you've given it all away. What about just becoming the best player that ever played the game? I think you'll be financially fine. Yeah. You know, so is that what your desire is? You know, is that what you're, is that what you're going after? But uh, you can't teach those things now. You can't yeah, teach no. passion. You can't teach toughness. You can't teach speed and you can't teach, uh, you know, these kids that have these goals that they're, they're, they're just, their, their mentality is so set. Yeah to do something where, you know, you and I had, we had a mentality where I'm, listen, I'm going here and I'm going to, I'm going to walk on here yeah. and I'm going to go out work every single guy at Ohio state. And if I don't make it, I got to, you know, the good Lord's got a better plan for me. 
Yeah. I think the biggest uh, thing for these guys is also being able to um, listen and just constructive criticism just listen, like, just listen, you know, you, a lot of these guys think like, you know, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm this top guy, this and that, but, and I've seen it, you know, in person when I was playing, it's just, you just have to just shut your mouth and just, just listen. Cause these, yeah. these are the experienced coaches that know what they're talking about. So, you know, once you get there, it's like, you just have to listen and, and, and you know, do smaller goals to get to the bigger one as you go. So that's yeah, right. That, that's all great stuff. So, so kind of going off that for high school guys. And now that um, you're with the bears, what do you look for in an NFL draft prospect? Because, you know, in high school, you can see the guys that are better than the other guys. But now you're you're looking at these prospects that are all phenomenal athletes. You know, is there anything different that you look for in, in, the, in the professional guys? I don't think – nothing's really changed in regards to what you look for. You know, you, you obviously – like I said, you know, the functional speed, the guys that can catch, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, football players and, and guys that obviously play with a lot of passion. So – I don't think that trait changes whatever level you're at coming from Mm -hmm. high school to college or college to the pros. uh, You still have to have your goals, right? You still have to have plans. You still have to be on a mission. Uh, You know, you have to be a smart football player. You got to show how you play on film. So I I just think there's a correlation to all of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and you can go back and watch high school film or go back and watch your freshman. I mean, there's so much film out there. People say all the time, well, let's go, let's go, you know, Check out this kid. He he sent a fin- film and he ran a four three. Man, that's great. Turn on his film from the last four years in high school and see that he never caught a football in his life. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. So you, you just have to do. Like I said, I, I really it doesn't matter at what level. I think you really have to break down the the speed. Is he a football player? What's his? Is he passionate about playing the game? What's his mission? Right? What's his purpose? And then going back, like what you just said, and we talked about it earlier, is, you know, you, then you find out your homework of, okay, when you're talking to this young man, okay, these are your goals. What's our relationship going to be like? Because I'm going to push you to match mm-hmm. these goals. That's why I asked you. Of course. So now how are you going to respond when I'm on your rear end, turning you into what you want to become? I, a matter of fact, here's, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your goals and I'm going to add to it and make you better than what you want to become. That's my, that's my job. But how are you going to handle that when I coach you to do that? You know, like, cause like what you're saying, well, I'm going to be, I'm not going to do that or want to do that. Well then, you know, obviously you got to figure out uh, if that's yeah. the right guy. And it's not easy for some guys to, to take that heat. <laughs> you know, it's, not. it's not, it's not, you know, you know, it's not because there's, there's such a fan base around these kids now. And I'm oh, sure you've seen it coming out of high school. Uh, there's such a fan base of expectation mm-hmm. um, that you get from a lot of people that are involved in these young men's lives. That, uh, that it's not that they cre- create delusional thoughts. It's more of just they, they create this higher confidence. Mm-hmm. And then uh, and sometimes these fans become way more confident and then the athlete. There's a lot of people, and we talked about this one time in our session, how many people are really insecure that are in your wide receiver room? You know, mm-hmm. how many people out there really think that they're as good as they're, all their fans and peers say they are? There's not a lot. And you there's know? not a lot of yes, and there's a lot of yes men and people and some of these younger guys. No one tells them no. So you know they're, right. the, they're the best kid at their school. And then when they go That's to college, right. it's like you're the there's a there's ten of you that were the best kids. So no one you no got to start, they, they got to start all over. And they can't handle. Yeah. It. And there's a lot yeah. of them that cannot handle that. This is not what I signed up for. I don't have to work this hard. And you're just kind of like you know obviously you're going to be part of that ninety nine percent that doesn't make it because you know less right. than one percent does. And so. Mm-hmm. That's, you just have to figure that out. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, one, one of your wide receiver told one of your recent one, ones you posted, it was um, the break points. And I, I believe somewhere in there you said something that we're going to come back and touch on this because I guess people were saying like, you know, what they talk about, like speed cut, square cut, um, what they mm-hmm. name and label everything. Was there – so I, I actually printed out your thing to have, but was there anything that you changed – um, that from people submitting or how you did things. And then I was also curious of, of what you meant by angle cut. So I was going through your list. I have it pulled up yeah, 45 yeah. degree and an angle cut. So just for anyone listening, cause you know, with, with what I'm doing and I know a lot of people, everyone has their own terminology, different coach, you know, coaches right. say different things. So just, I'm kind of curious at how you label your things and, and why. Yeah. So the, the 45 degree cut would, I mean, the 45 degree cut would be kind of like your slant, your deep slant, yep. your quick game slant, your five step slant, it could be mm-hmm. a seven step, you know, a seven step post, some people call it, mm-hmm. or a, a or a glance route or 
yeah, you know, skinny eight, post, yeah. angle post, bang eight, you know, they're everywhere. Yeah. Like you say, every, yeah. I've heard it all uh, in everybody's yeah. offense that I've been involved. But, um, and then even like the post route up top, um, you know, like that indicator. But to me, that, that one step cut, that, that angle cut, uh, that 45 degree cut, if you have free access running a slant route, you're going to take yeah. that, that third step underneath you and set your 45 degree angle. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's to me is going to be your 45 degree or an angle cut is, you know, is kind of what I, you know, is what I've always been taught and how I've kind of related to that okay. uh, terminology. So, they're, the, so they're, they're pretty much the same thing. Yeah. What I did was I put 45 degree and angle in there together to, cause they're, they're gotcha. the same thing, meaning, meaning the same cut. Gotcha. Cause I just I'm know, I've heard like, a lot of people say 45 okay. degree cut and then an angle gotcha. cut. So, uh, yeah, no, the, the, I'll tell you the angle cut that I've always learned that I've heard is where you take that one step, which is underneath you, not outside your frame, like an indicator step. Right. It's really just that one powerful step underneath you to mm-hmm. set your angle. And, and mm-hmm. so you keep it underneath you. And so that obviously to me is that three to five uh, or seven steps okay. uh, slant. Yeah. Cause, cause the way I teach it, I, I broke it down with speed cut, square cut, and then curl comeback. So like, um, you know, <clears throat> for speed cut, you have 90 degrees, which is, you know, you're yep. quick out, you're 10 yard out, you know, dig. And then I have 45, which is the slant post corner. And then I also have um, a speed cut as the rocker step where it's where you're running full speed and it's one, two, but it's a speed cut. So then right. I go in the I go in the square cut and I have two through four. I, I always try to tell the guys don't go more than four. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no. I I was just curious, that, you know, if there was anything else and you know different things that you came across or switched out from your list or any keywords that you grabbed from anyone else. Yeah, I I just you know there was a you know obviously a lot of people use that pressure step, um, mm-hmm. you know using that for their you know either their that powerful step in the ground. <clears throat> Um, but going back to your point, everybody's it's right, wrong, or indifferent. We're all speaking the same thing. Um, so it's, it's really, you know, what, which one of those cuts are you teaching regards to what routes we're running? Like you're talking about right. the square in, whether that be your square cut or a speed out, um, you know, your five yard speed out is going to be same thing as your, um, your, your 10 yard speed out also, you know, it's mm-hmm. just obviously Correct. further down the field. So you have all those speed cuts, but the 45 and the angle to me was really the only time you'll use gotcha. it would be on that three or five step slant, keeping that leg underneath you. The reason why I put on there that it's different than the post cut is because a lot of times on that post cut, you're given that Overextend. indicator step. Yeah. So you're overextending your <clears throat> foot. So now you're not, you're getting outside of your frame mm-hmm. rather than what you would do on a 45 degree or a slant route. Cause that there, you got to put your foot in the ground and go. Mm-hmm. That makes so, sense. And then obviously the corner route also, cause on the corner route, you give that indicator step before you go. Right. So that to me would be a little bit different than an angle or, or a 45 degree. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I'm probably yeah. wrong, but that's how no, I love it. I, that, that was, that was actually one of the things I was really following. Cause you know, I, I I'm more looking in toward, you know, I'm just looking at everyone. That's, that's why I loved it. Cause other coaches right. are saying stuff. So I'm just grabbing different terminology, um, you know, different ways to explain these things. Um, and, and one of the ones that I, I learned from a coach was cut the grass between you and the defender. Like that was one of the, one of the ones I love. So like I was, I was mm-hmm. coming on your page just trying to come up with different ways to explain the breaks and yeah, someone at, at your level. Um, but now that, now that we're everyone's home and, and, you know, this is time to study the game and stuff. Is there anything that you, um, whether that's books, online resources, things that you are constantly going on to get better or is it just, you know, yeah, like, I'll tell you, we, I've been, uh, doing a lot of stuff on leadership. You know, just okay. being able to communicate uh, with the guys, uh, a lot of the guys, you know, past experience from old school football and uh, and just kind of, you know, the, the leadership of those coaches or, uh, you know, kind of programs that they've built and how they build it. You know, obviously some things you'll agree with, some things you don't. Mm-hmm. But uh, my, my big thing has just been the leadership part of as much as I can right now, just trying to be able to communicate with those guys. Yeah. And, and, and those kids need that leadership stuff. And even if those kids can understand that early, just for themselves, you know, we, when when they're done playing, just moving on forward in life, and yep. just all that. So that all, all that stuff is just extremely important for these guys to have. <laughs>